This is Rockin' with Jam Man. Is with any Curran. So how are you doing, man? I am doing very well, thank you. I just got back from uh, a little trip in Los Angeles. I was down there for something called the NAM Show. I don't know if you're aware of that it stands for the North American Music Mart, and um, a lot of the music instrument manufacturers like you know Gibson and Fender and Rickenbacker and the people that make keyboards, Moog and uh, all the amplifiers, Marshall and Tech 21, all those folks are down there. So I, ha I had a really good uh, couple days nerding out over musical instruments. That was fun. So how's life treating you? Sorry, can you say that again? How's life treating you? I feel pretty lucky, Jam Man. I got to tell you that. I'm um, just being able to continue to do music. Uh, I mentioned before we were... Um, on air that uh, that I'm coming down to Buffalo playing a show with my old band Coney Hatch and we're going to open up for Kim Mitchell and um, then you know I've got this project with the 30th anniversary of my my solo record coming coming out or it's already out right now and then I've got the side project with Alex Lifeson called Envy of None so I feel pretty lucky right now man I'm making a, doing a lot of music and and uh, feeling pretty lucky that i that i still get the opportunity to do that so you are a famous 80s canadian rocker from coney hat right i guess you could say i am yeah i've been kicking around for a long time but um when we when i started coney uh coney hatch in the 80s we got lucky enough to to tour with some really really cool bands like we were out on the screaming for vengeance tour with uh with judas priest and then we did the peace of mind tour with iron maiden um we played with crocus and accept and um peter frampton and ted nugent and cheap trick and the list goes on and on so that was pretty cool for me because i was a young guy back then and uh touring with a lot of those bands they were they they were some of my favorite bands so that was a bit of a pinch me moment you know like i couldn't believe we were even on the same stage as those guys. So, yeah, that, those were fun days back in the 80s. You, you were just a twinkle in your parents' eye at that point. You weren't even around. Before we start talking about your new project, I want to talk about something. Sure. Why do you think bands can be huge in Canada, but not break out in the States? You know, that's a very good question because... Um, you living in Buffalo, like you're, you realize that you just got to cross a border and you're into our country and it, and it just seems so close. Right. Mm -hmm. And to me, to me, um, you know, the biggest difference a lot of the record labels in, um, in some of the other Sorry, somebody's trying to call me right now. I'm going to tell them I'm going to call them back, right? Sorry. Okay. Um, you know, for instance, I, rem I remember a, a, a record label coming to see my band. And at that time, we had three top 10 singles in Canada. We were on Much Music. We had two videos in high rotation. We were, uh, the record was almost gold. And they said, you know, it, it doesn't really matter that you're big in Canada because that means that you're the equivalent of being big in the state of Illinois <laughs> and so we were like oh, okay I get it you know the U.S. is such a big market that being a success in Canada sometimes doesn't mean anything in the U.S. and it's always been something that's eluded a lot of Canadian artists like I think about a band called Tragically Hip and they are massive massive here in Canada they sell hundreds of thousands of records but they were never able to really make it in the u.s so that that a lot of canadian bands were able to to strike it big in the states i'm in buffalo so yeah like i'm a border town because i can literally just like walk into canada if i wanted to since i live in buffalo like, yeah so i know like all the big bands like headstones big sugar tragically hip but then you go further down in the u.s and these bands really aren't known at all. 
No, you're, and you've named off a couple of really good ones there, you know, that have done very well here in Canada. And with you being on the border and same with people that live in Detroit, they're able to just, you know, dial in rock radio and listen to these Canadian bands. Uh, but when you start getting further into like California and Florida and and deep in the Midwest and the South, it's it's like you're right none of these bands are even well known there but other border towns that that always helped bands like mine because we could go across to buffalo and we could play upstate new york and um syracuse and even in pittsburgh you know we got to do some really good shows in pittsburgh but it's it's a tough battle man to try to get get noticed in the states so your new project envy of none has a new ep coming out right we do. Yeah, it was just announced um, yesterday. So the new EP is a five song EP. Um, four of the songs are remixes, like really cool remixes. We deconstructed the songs and um, gave them a very different feel. And then we recorded a brand new song called That Was Then, This Is Now. Um, and I think the coolest thing about adding that new song is because when the Envy of None record came out, I think a lot of people thought maybe it might just be a one-off and then we would all move on, but we had such a good time making that record that we're going to, uh, we're going to, we've already started working on a second record, but this one kind of just fires a shot in the air to go, Hey, envy of none is still here. It's kind of crazy how you used to open for rush, but now you're playing with Alex. <laughs> I, it, it is beyond crazy. I would, I've said to some of my friends, you know, like if you had asked me 10 or 20 years ago, Hey, do you ever, do you ever think that, you know, you'd work with on a musical side, I would be like, why don't you never, and to me, I'm still amazed. And I pinch myself, you know, that I'm even working with Alex. I feel very lucky. I, I certainly didn't didn't see that in my crystal ball. That's for sure. How did you get, how did you guys all hook up? Do you mean the envy of none people? Yeah, like uh, with are you Alex talking about and, like, envy? Of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, with with Alex, it was an interesting story because um, he called me one day and asked me if I would put some bass guitar on, uh, on on a couple of his tracks. And I jokingly asked him, I said, uh, don't you know any other bass players? You know, do, I think, you know, a guy named Gabby Lee on speed dial how come you're not on these songs and he was like well you know getty's busy writing his book and um i'd really appreciate it and if you could do this for me um i will return the favor and put some guitar on on some of your songs right so anyway um i had been working and i had met maya win our vocalist i had been working on some songs with her and so i said to alex can i send you some songs that i'm working on with this young female vocalist in portland oregon and um so i sent him a couple demos that i'd done with uh with maya and he said oh my god andy like her voice is awesome uh, i would love to work with you on that i'd love to put some guitars on it and um so that's how we got alex and maya and myself involved and then i've got a very good friend in in toronto um and he is a really good mixing engineer and plays keyboards and guitars and his name is alf annabellini so i played alf some of the demos and he said dude i would love to work on these with you and so that's how the four of us all got together um and we worked remotely from our studios sending songs back and forth so this new EP has some new songs and remixes from the one you put out last year, right? It does, yeah. Um, so the uh, the interesting thing is when I, I, you know, when I went into the archives and started listening to all this music, Jam Man, I forgot that we recorded two full songs and we never put them on the record i completely forgot about it like that's 30 years old you know so i was going through these the, the all of these audio tapes and i was like oh my god you know there's a song called walk the other way and one woman man and so we pulled those out and i thought that they would be good to finish off so we had to we'd never mix them so we we mixed them and added them to this record and then 
there was part of me that I'm very proud of that that record that I did back in 1990, 91. But there was part of me that just thought it could use some refreshing. So I called a friend of mine, Vic Florencia, who is a Juno award winning mixer. And I asked him if he would be interested in um, remixing the album because I wanted to make it sound a little bit more contemporary and take some of the reverb off the drums and take some of the reverb off my vocals. So that was the reason why I wanted to remix it. So is this Alex a new full time gig? Um, no, everything pretty much is is part time for me. So I, I'm I'm part time in Coney Hatch, part time with my own band with, that we just released, Whiskey and the Devil, and part time with with Alex and and Maya and Alf and Envy of None. Um, and then if you combine all of those, they very much feel like a full time yeah. job. <laughs> That makes sense. Do you think Rush will ever do anything to, to, together again? I hope they will. Next year is their 50th anniversary. And I can tell you, Jam Man, that Alex Lifeson and Getty Lee are still best friends and they hang out all the time. So I've got my fingers crossed. I know Getty's got a new book coming out next year, which is going to take up a lot of his time. I believe he's going to go out on a book tour and promote it. But um, I don't know, something tells me with the 50th anniversary of Rush coming next year that maybe if ever there was a time for those two guys to get back together and, and work together, it would probably be next year. I know one of these tracks is a tribute to Neil. Was this song very emotional for you guys? I know it was for Alex. And, and you know, when Alex asked me to play bass on that track, he never told me that he had written it for for Neil. Uh, I'm kind of glad that he didn't because that's a lot of pressure, you know, to know that he was writing a, a tribute song to one of his best friends and the drummer of Rush. Um, it wasn't until afterwards that I uh, that I played the bass on it and he sent it back and we asked him if he wanted to put it on the MB of None record. And he said, Maya, why don't you try to sing, sing along to it? And she said, I love it as an instrumental. And you know, but if you want me to write some lyrics, tell me where the inspiration came from. And that's when Alex told all of us that um, one of his last visits to Neil, when Neil was very ill and fighting cancer, he was um, had a really nice dinner with Neil and he was sitting out on the balcony at Neil's place in California. And they were just out there having a drink and looking at the sunset. And um, that's where he got inspired with this by writing the song called Western Sunset. I know Alex is tight with the Trailer Park Boys. Do you think Envy Oof could uh, maybe do a cam cameo on the new season? Any of you guys? <laughs> I would love that because I love the Trailer Park Boys. And um, I think they contacted Alex recently to ask him if he would be interested in being in a couple more episodes. So stay tuned on that one. I don't know whether it's for sure, but... Uh, um, I know that I know all of the guys like and, and Bubbles, Mike Smith is a friend of mine. So maybe I'll tell him that I did an interview with you today and that you're suggesting we do a cameo. How about that? Yeah, I would love to see that because I kind of love I like, Mike toys. Toy, toy. Yeah, I, I like that idea, Jam, man. Do you ever get worried that the band might get overshadowed by Alex Fame? Um, you know, he's... He's such a humble guy that I don't think he would let that happen. But let's call a spade a spade. I mean, the guys, we have a member in Envy of None that is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, you know, Rush has sold in excess of 34 million records. So it's kind of hard to uh, not be in the shadow of that guy. But, you know, if he, if he was on this interview with us, he would tell you that Envy of None is like a four four people project with everybody being equal but i would arguably say that we have uh we've got a secret weapon in our in in our band and his name is alex lifeson is that why you guys uh sound like nothing like rush is that why you guys sound nothing like what rush well i think for us it was an opportunity to try to 
write something different and do something different because Alex and I had both been playing rock for a very, very long time. When I started to write these ideas, um, you know, part of being a musician is that you don't want to do the same thing over and over again. And I know fans don't like that. Fans, you know, I'm the same way. If I if I love a band, you know, like like Cheap Trick, I love Cheap Trick. If all of a sudden Cheap Trick released a record and it sounded nothing like Cheap Trick, I would be pretty disappointed. So um, I know for some people who heard Envy of None, they were like, what the heck is going on here? This sounds nothing like Rush or nothing like Coney Hatch. But we did that intentionally. And I think people who have an open mind about it they they love the combination of of everything that we're doing and i think you know with maya's vocals on top it's just like the cherry on the top but uh that was an intentional move to to write material that did not sound like anything like our bands previous bands in the states when a crowd wants to harass a a live band they scream play they uh they scream play free bird in Canada, do, right. do they scream "Play Tom Sawyer"? <laughs> Sawyer I God. haven't. I, yeah, I haven't heard that, but I think that would be a good thing to just scream "Tom Sawyer." I have a couple brothers, and um, I can tell you when they get bored, they start yelling out uh, uh, Led Zeppelin at the top of their lungs. They're just screaming Led Zeppelin. But um, I haven't heard Tom Sawyer yet. Not yet, Jam Man. Wow. What are the plans for the release of the EP? So we announced it yesterday. If you go on social media on and, and search Envy of None or you search uh, Andy Kern official, you'll see all of the news there. Um, and we've also got a picture disc coming out for a vinyl picture disc coming up for record store day. So um, the best way to, to, to see the plans and the release dates, I think it's coming out sometime in I wish I could remember this. My memory's a little bit bad, but I think it's coming out in July sometime. But um, if you go to envyofnone.com, all of the details are there. But, uh, you know, it's going to come out on vinyl and and uh, on our official website. Um, we're going to be doing some signing of limited edition versions as, as well. So anybody listening to the interview, the best place to go is envyofnone.com. You plan on going on tour this year? Um, I'm doing some shows with Coney Hatch. One of them is in your, in your backyard. We're going to be playing with Kim Mitchell in September. Um, we're playing the Burlington Waterfront Festival with Coney Hatch also in September. Um, uh, oh, sorry, in June. And then we actually just got added to Sweden Rock, uh, the night that Iron Maiden is headlining. So we're going to be going out to, uh, to Sweden in June, which will be pretty, that, that'll be a lot of fun. What do you think about ticket prices getting super high for a lot of bands? I hate to see it myself because I know, you know, I have two young daughters and they, they are very big music fans and they like to buy tickets and they're always asking me, dad, how come these tickets are 250 bucks? And, you know, you think about uh, on the flip side, I hate to see people pay that much for, for tickets, but on the flip side, you know, there's the, the cost of the bus and the gas and and feeding people and paying road crews and um, buying production and everything. So it really is, it's an expensive venture to tour. And a lot of times these bands, the only way to make up and pay for everything that I just mentioned to you is by charging uh, a little bit more money for tickets. But, you know, when you start seeing stuff like I'm, I'm a big Depeche Mode fan. And when those tickets went on sale here in Toronto, I think there were $630 and I was like, this, this is just ridiculous. You know, that, that's a lot of money to pay for one show. I wanted to see Pantera this year, but they're charging like 300, like $300 a ticket. And that even for like the best seats, lawn tickets are like a hundred dollars. And who wants to be out there? I know that's that's a lot of money, man. Like you think about how long you got to work to pay 300 bucks for a ticket or or even if you can't afford it, 100 bucks to be on the lawn and the bands like as big as a little fly. It's frustrating for music fans out there. And, and I don't know what it's going to take for the pendulum to 
to swing to make it right because it just feels like ticket prices are going up and there's no end to it. I wish I had an answer for it and a solution, but it's frustrating for music fans for sure. What is life like for you on the road? Whenever I go on the road, I always take my tennis rackets with me on my days off. I try to play tennis. Um, uh, I always, you know, try to stay in shape a little bit. If the gym, if there's a gym in the hotel, I'd like to work out a little bit. Um, like to check out restaurants and and go to record stores on my day off. And there's a lot of downtime, you know, like when you're waiting for sound check and in between shows and everything. But uh, I try to make the best of it find really cool restaurants I, I'm, I'm a bit of a foodie so if i'm in a town you know that's known for its barbecue food like maybe kansas city or something like that i'll go find the best barbecue joint so i try to keep busy when i'm out there what's life like for you on the road that was the one that you just asked oh my god i'm so sorry bro uh, i'm sorry no worries. i i do that no sometimes. Worries. i'm sorry no worries bud What's the best venue you've ever played? Well, I want to say Red Rocks Amphitheater in um, Denver. Uh, it's it's a natural amphitheater carved out the side of the uh, out of a, out of a mountain, and it's all red rocks. Um, my band that's called was called Caramel that was signed to Geffen. We played a show there, and we opened up for um, Creed. And um, it was just such an amazing vibe. It was an outdoor venue. And anybody that doesn't know Red Rocks, go out and, and, and look it up online and see what it looks like. The, 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 it's just a, it's like a, one of the seven wonders of the world. It should be the eighth wonder of the world. But that was such a fun gig to play. And it's a, and it's a big amphitheater. And you just look up and there's rows and rows of people all sitting in the side of a mountain. It's wicked. What's the worst venue you've ever played? <laughs> okay, so when I was getting ready to go out on the road with my Whiskey and the Devil band, my manager told me that I should go out and play some shows and, and blow the rust off and, and rehearse a little bit outside Toronto. So we went to this small mining town in Kirkland Lake, Ontario, and we played to a bunch of drunken old men who did not like the band at all. And one of the crazy things about that show that night, Jam Man, is that in order to get to the restrooms, you had to walk across the stage. So people were walking across our stage the whole night to go to the bathroom. That was brutal. That was like, I was like, who puts a bathroom behind a stage? That was that was the one of the worst gigs I've ever played in my life. That has to be like humiliating. Like, I couldn't even imagine you're trying to play a song and then somebody's like, it's a big one coming. Oh God. Yeah. Or else they're like, excuse me, I gotta I gotta take a leak. Excuse me. And you know, I've got my bass and I'm turning sideways. It was brutal. Um, but when you play a bad show like that, it, it makes you appreciate a good show. But uh I'm not gonna lie, that I I think it was even called the Miners in in Kirk in Kirkland Lake, Ontario. It, anybody listening, avoid Kirkland Lake at all costs. It's a godforsaken town. What's on your rider? We have Smarties with the red ones taken out. No, I'm only kidding. That's oh, what Van Halen does. <laughs> um, we have we have some, you know, like I think the probably the funniest thing that we put on there. Some, uh, really like to have in a movie but sometimes we put an item on to see if the promoter's paying attention and i ask for six pairs of white tube socks just to see if they'll bring me in tube socks because i like to put on fresh socks after the show <laughs> sometimes they're like you're not getting your tube socks buddy do you get bummed out when you don't get your tube socks No, I just, I kind of laugh. Just, I want to see if people are paying attention because sometimes I wonder if they're even reading it. So it's nice sometimes when they say, hey, by the way, here's all your rider, but you're not getting the tube socks. And I'm like, no problem. Um, I should just throw on Captain Crunch there and see if they're paying attention. I might do that for the next show and see if they can get some boxes of Captain Crunch backstage. Okay. 
Do you have a ritual before you guys go on stage? Um, I personally do, and it's a vocal warm up. I I put my headphones on, and I've got a I've got a um, iPod with a thirty minute vocal warm up just to get my vocal cords all warmed up, and um, and then I usually I, I keep that on, and then usually while I'm there, I'm I'm just figuring out what kind of stupid clothes I want to wear that night. So that that's kind of my ritual. And then 10 minutes before I go on, I'll ask for one of my bass guitars and I'll do a little bit of a 10 minute warm up just to get my fingers moving. But most of it is just to prepare for the show. Did you ever have a crazy interaction with a fan? Um, Yeah, the craziest. Uh, uh, listen, I got a really good story. I have to tell you, um, Jam Man, I got a, I got a, a call that I was supposed to make at four o'clock. I'm five minutes behind, but if you don't mind, if there's any other questions that that yeah, I haven't said, like we can sneak them in. But let me tell you about the crazy interaction. So, okay. Um, when I was uh, playing in Coney Hatch, I was young enough that I was still staying at home at my parents' place, and after a gig one night. Um, I went back to my parents' place and I I opened the door and and with my key, but it wasn't locked. Um, it was unlocked, and I walked into the front hall and there was a girl that had broken into my parents' house, and she was waiting in the dark like a crazy horror movie scene that she was going to stab me or something. And I turned the lights on. I didn't know who it was, and uh, it was dropping some f bombs going who the f are you how did you get in here and she said i've got the messages that you were sending me in your songs and i'm here to tell you that i'm your new girlfriend and i was like oh my god so anyway i, I ended up calling the police uh, it was kind of a sad story that um she was off her medications and it was a girl that was suffering from schizophrenia but you know walking into your parents' house at two o'clock in the morning and the total stranger is there saying, I'm getting the messages that you sent me in your songs. That was pretty crazy for me. That was probably the weirdest one for me, Jam Man. Were you terrified? Like, were you actually genuinely scared? Ab absolutely. I was like, does this person have a weapon? Are they, What's going on? How is this chapter going to end? And my mom is such a beautiful lady. She came down and said to the girl, would you like me to make you a cup of tea? And I'm like, no, don't offer her a cup of tea. We got to get the police here. We got to get get her the hell out of the house. <laughs> that's kind of that's crazy. I mean, you. I can't believe anyway, you said that. But um, yeah, yeah. Would you like a cup of tea? That just tells you what my mom's like. She's such a beautiful lady. But uh, that was pretty scary. And you asked me what my craziest interaction with the fan was. And and um, like I said, I, I felt kind of sad because, you know, she there, obviously there was some some medical issues there. But um, but, you know, I've had a, I've had a really good time chatting with you. Buddy. And if there's if there's any more, if there's one last question that you want me to do before I sign off, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Of just one more, like a favor to ask. Do you think yeah. you could get Alex to interview me? Okay, sorry, I missed that. What What were you gonna ask me? Do you think you could get Alex to interview me? Oh, you're frozen. Wait, you're I, you're frozen too. Can you hear me? Hello. I got you back. You froze there. You said I'm gonna ask you a favor, and then you froze. Okay, you. Yeah, the internet's kind of been bad a little bit. No, no problem. Um, do you think you could get Alex to interview me? I could certainly ask him, and I, I'll tell you. Your mobile device is still in the vehicle. Sorry, one sec here, buddy. Don't go anywhere. Okay, I'm on. I'm gonna connect the device here again. Can you st can you still hear me, Jam Man? Yeah, I can still hear you perfectly. Mm -hmm. Okay, what I was going to say is um, once you put my interview up and there's a link that I could send to Alex, I'm going to send it to him and tell him I had a blast doing the interview with you and would he consider talking to you. I can't promise it to you, bud, but I, I think um, I think he would get a kick out of our interview that we did. And, and once you've got it done and cut up and ready, will you promise to send it to Chip and Chip will send it to me? Uh-huh, I promise. It's been a very, you've been very generous, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you, man. 
and you enjoy your next interview. But you have a nice night, man. Have a good one, bro. Thank I'll you. I'll see you at Thank one of the back. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. And I had a blast. Cheers. See ya. Bye. Bye. Peace.